Hello Springfield Faith Center. It is Good Friday, and Good Friday is such a blessed time. It's the time that we pay tribute to the death of Jesus. Some would even call it a lamentation. We lament the death of Jesus because there's, there's so much angst, there's so much heartache about it. Good Friday has this beautiful place in my heart. I grew up in a very traditional church, a church that uh, we did liturgy, we did hymns, we did a lot of beautiful, wonderful things. On Good Friday, we would always put a black veil over the cross. And the cross was this large, beautiful image of Jesus hanging on the cross. And that black veil would cover it to symbolize that Jesus has died. Now something funny for me is uh, I always got confused between whether it was called Good Friday or Black Friday because that black veil convinced me that Friday was supposed to be black. Now you can see where this is going. The Friday after Thanksgiving, to me, always felt like it was supposed to be good. I mean, you're getting these amazing, wonderful deals, aren't you? So why on earth is it called Black Friday? I was totally convinced that that Friday was called Good Friday. And even to this day, I still sometimes think to myself that Good Friday is after Thanksgiving and Black Friday is right before Easter. So I've got them a little bit confused, but if you're like me, you will eventually come to realize that Good Friday is the day that we celebrate the death of Jesus. It's not just that we, we lament and we pour out our hurt, but there's a celebration in that lament. There's a celebration in giving over that pain and that angst to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's something powerful in knowing that Jesus is with us. We as Christians, we have a tendency to skip over Friday. Not many people go to Good Friday services. Easter is the big celebration, and rightly so. We, we are people of the resurrection, not necessarily people of the cross. See, did you know that the cross wasn't actually the main symbol of Jesus for many, many years? It was a fish on the ground that represented uh, Jesus making uh, his blessing manifold. The cross was something that came in later when we encountered the Celtics, not something we need to get into, but it wasn't the cross that we looked to in our faith. It was the resurrection. And yet today, there is something powerful about recognizing the cross in our life, about not skipping over Friday, not skipping over Saturday, but going and resting in them and letting ourselves recognize the hurt and the pain that comes with Good Friday and even Saturday. The burial rituals of the ancient Near East were some amazing. When somebody died, uh, they would wrap them in this beautiful shroud. Their face was covered with a special cloth. Their hands and feet were tied with another special cloth. For eight hours, relatives and friends would come to the house and they would say their goodbye to their deceased friend. There was something powerful in this, but it was only eight hours because in a very warm climate, you can't let a dead body rest for too long. And so there was this massive procession, this beautiful, wonderful procession to the tomb. Women often were at the very front of that procession and they would be crying and wailing and you would know that someone had died. Not like in America where we have private funerals off to the side, this was something people would experience. And whether you knew the deceased or not, you were a part of honoring their life. But this wasn't the case for everyone. Jesus didn't get this beautiful procession. Let me read to you out of Matthew 27. This is verse 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Notice it was this disciple, this disciple alone who did this. He took Jesus' body and put it in that tomb. There was no great procession. Even the disciples, the, the, the important 12, were not a part of this. This man, this Joseph, did it by himself. You see, our expectations are never entirely met. 
mean, I can imagine that even Jesus, as he's reflecting back on his death, something I think we all wish we could do, you know, it would be amazing to be able to go to our funeral and see what our funeral is. I often wonder to myself, what would it be like to be at my own funeral? Would it be my friends and family, a few people? Or have I actually reached out and touched as many people as possible? Two of the most important people that I think are incredibly powerful in our culture that have died recently uh, are Dave Lanning, the pastor of Spring Hill Face, and Lauren Lane, one of the elders. When I went to their funerals, there was standing room only. It was a testament to how powerful these men were in the lives of so many people. Yet here's the amazing thing. You wouldn't know it just talking to them. There was no great, um, there was nothing about them that said, I've changed the lives of hundreds of people. In fact, when you see them, they are just down to earth, normal human beings. But their lives touched so many people. I look to them and I wonder to myself, am I going to be like them? Where I get to be touched and surrounded by so many people because of the difference that I made in people's lives. I did a funeral once, many years ago, where there was maybe 30 people. It's not a bad funeral. It's not a bad way to go. Family and friends, having somebody there to reach out and to know that you made a difference in somebody's lives. And yet I've heard stories stories of uh, from fellow pastors that they go there and they realize this was not a person that these people are coming to lament. In fact, some of these people are joyous at the death. But who are we as Christians? That we come to the death of Jesus and it doesn't mean much to us. Who are we as Christians that we reach out and we say, forget the funeral procession. We're going right to Easter. We're going right to the resurrection. Friends, right now, in the time we are at, we are not at the resurrection. The time we are at, we are hurting. We are in pain. We are in sorrow. There is something dark about this time. Not just the weather that I'm standing in right now as it begins to rain, but there's something dark about the feel of this time. You can't go to a friend's house. You can't go to your parents' house. You can't go to the places that you want to be at. We want to, our kids are home from school, it'd be great to be able to take them to parks, to take them to bounce this, you know, trampoline house, like warehouse thing. It would be great to take them to experience new things, the Oregon Coast Aquarium, maybe uh, the zoo. But right now, we do not get to experience life the way that we want to. We are stuck indoors. We are stuck isolated. We are stuck feeling like there is nothing here for us. In fact, some people, some people are so uh, hurt by this season that they've lost their jobs, that they have lost everything that they thought they had. We thought, what was it, 14 years ago, 2008, uh, 2008, 2009, we thought that was the lowest that we could get. And yet here we are experiencing more pain. My grandfather, I talked to him a couple days ago, and he said to me, he was born during the Great Depression. And he said, I was born during the Great Depression. I may die during another. What a painful way to bookend in somebody's life. And yet my grandfather is one of the most amazing people that I know. You talk to him and he is telling you details about 1955 when he took somebody and they traveled to some place and he remembers the name, he remembers the face. He remembers what they talked about. My grandpa was one of those people who touched people's lives. And it doesn't matter the bookend that he went through. It doesn't matter where he started or where he ends up. It's what's in the middle that made such a massive difference. My grandfather is one of those people who touched lives. You know, it's funny. We as Christians, we get caught up in what am I going to tell people? What am I going to say to people? When they're experiencing pain and heartache, how do I change their life? I'm not an evangelist. You tell me to go into to, uh, you know, some mall and say, change people's lives. Go to the mall, save people. I'll tell you, I, I, I got things I need to do. I gotta go play guitar, I gotta go practice. I gotta go do some thing, I got work to do. I'm not an evangelist. I am not somebody who's going to make 
a powerful difference to some random stranger. I do not have that kind of self-confidence. But I know people who do. I know people who could step into that. But we don't have to step out into the world with the Bible in our hands to profess a belief. See, Jesus didn't teach us. And he didn't say, say these magic words so that you can convert everyone to my faith. He said, live like me. Follow me. Do the things that I do. Show people what it is to live. I don't know if you've ever noticed, Jesus never quotes scripture to those he begins to heal. He never quotes scripture to the man who is dropped down from the ceiling, paralyzed. He just says, your sins are forgiven. When challenged, he then turns to him and says, walk. He doesn't quote scripture at him to convince him. He's just there for them. He makes a difference in people's lives. It's even the end of life that we can find that we still make a difference. There was this doctor in the second century named Galen, hated Christians with the passion. He thought we were all out of our minds, following some dead deity who had no right to make an influence. But he said this about Christians. In fact, the Christians who were dying, he said, despite the fact that these are absurd and silly people, one cannot but help and notice that when they face their death as martyrs, they do so with the joy of God and not the sadness of depression. There is something powerful in death that it makes us all equal. None of us get to escape it, except for Jesus. Jesus is the only one who escapes death. Robin Perry, in his book, The Biblical Cosmos, points out that Jesus is unique, even amongst all the religions, he's unique. He starts off in heaven, the Son of God. He comes down to earth, born incarnate as human. He dies and goes to heaven. And yet he is risen, he comes back to earth, teaches more to his disciples, explains to them what the scriptures were saying, shows them who he is and then he ascends into heaven he is the only deity the only being the only one ever capable of starting and moving all the way and then coming back home. friends jesus takes us out of the darkness into the light now keep in mind he doesn't always just miraculously change your situation if you've lost your job you may be without a job for sorry. There's a darkness we live in in this world. If you've gotten sick and you're at home quarantining yourself, thank you. We appreciate what you're doing. Know that you are loved, that you are not alone, that you are not by yourself. God is with you. Jesus is with you. The Spirit is with you. Everything you are going through because God is with you. Now, I don't know why he's letting this happen. He's God. Maybe he could miraculously make things change. But last week in his message, Pastor Steve taught us that there are so many expectations that go unmet. That there are so many things that we experience that we may just have to grapple with. You see, I don't know that God wants to change your situation. He wants to change you. He wants to change what you're about. He wants to refocus your life so that you can hone in on what really matters. And guess what, my friends? He may be the one who's saying to you, I want you to change so you can change someone, else, someone else's circumstance. I got a position at the job I'm in where I have a little bit of influence. And what was amazing is I found people who were hurt needing a job. Now I can't hire and fire at my job, but I was able to help them submit a resume and I was able to say to my bosses, this is somebody that you should hire. They will do an amazing job. That's the kind of influence that Christians have. Where we could easily say, I want the greatest and the best. I want to be able to make the most money, but instead I'm going to back up and I'm going to say, this is somebody who's hurting. I'm going to hold them and I'm going to show them that there is a better way. I'm going to give them a job. Maybe it's visiting somebody that you want to otherwise want to spend time We all know what that's like. Sometimes the greatest thing you can do is simply to be present for someone. 
There's a scripture verse in Isaiah. This is Isaiah 40. It says, Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a, pla a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You see, we are in the midst of darkness right now. We're in the midst of fear, of chaos, of feeling like there is nothing that can save us. But there's the glory of the Lord. And that glory is going to lead us. It will lead us into a future like we could not imagine. Phyllis Tickle, in one of her books, points out that there is this 500 year cycle that the kingdom of God goes through. You've got Moses, you've got uh, King David. 500 years later, you've got the destruction of Israel and the captivity. 500 years after that is Jesus. Another 500 years, you've got the rise and fall of the Roman Christians. Another 500 years after that, Christianity is no longer united, it has split. Another 500 years after that, uh, Martin Luther comes on the scene, nails his 95 theses on the door and begins an entirely new revolution. 500 years after that is us. Friends, I think that we're in this place where we are seeing a new kingdom. This amazing technology allows me to be able to speak to you in your living room without having to leave my house. We can be quarantined and yet still talk to each other. But maybe there's something more powerful in this technology that allows us to reach into homes. And maybe the technology reminds us that once we get to go out again, once we get to go back to our normal lives, let them not just be normal. Let them be Jesus-focused. Let them be people-focused. Let them be focused on relationship. See, that's what Jesus was about. We get so transfixed on the divinity of Jesus that we completely forgot that he is human. We completely forgot that he actually lived a life some 33 years, he lived like you and me. He lived the heartaches, the suffering, the pain. He knew what it was like to hurt. He knew what it was like to laugh. He knew what it was like to cry. In Good Friday today, we celebrate not just what it means to be a people of resurrection, but also the people who know what it is to live. There are so many songs out there that says, this world is not my world, my home is in heaven. And yet I wanna to say to you that even though our home is in heaven, we live here for however long, whether it's 33 years, whether it's 90 years, maybe it's even less. We live here now and we can make a difference now. The kingdom of God is present in this moment. Do not be afraid to rest in the suffering. Do not be afraid to recognize what Good Friday does in your life. There is something powerful in recognizing the hurt you're in right now. And yet Jesus doesn't leave us there. Jesus doesn't leave us on Good Friday. When the disciples dispersed, it's Saturday, they're wandering around going, what, what am I supposed to do with myself? I guess I'll go back to fishing. Jesus comes. He comes back the next day on Easter. He walks with his disciples and he takes them onto a new path. And notice that he, in his berating of the disciples, it's never this sense of like, oh my gosh, how could you forsake me? It was always, now you see. Christians, friends, loved ones, now you see. Good Friday is not this moment where we suffer in this time know that God is present with us. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, where we are hurting, we know you are present. Open our eyes that we may see that. Shed light upon our hearts that even in the darkest recesses, we see you are there. As difficult as this is going to get, 
We lean on you for our strength. God, thank you that you do not forsake us. You died for us, that we may stand in your glory. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice and showing us how to live. In your name we pray, amen.